Welcome to the last day of PMAC. It has been a very productive and tiring week for many of us, and I hope that it has been an educational experience for you, as well as an, a very good platform for you to network with your colleagues and your partners in health. I thought it's very important to highlight that this is one of the most important sessions across the whole PMAC, because many of us could only attend one session particularly during the parallel sessions. And it's difficult to get a sense of what is happening in the other four parallel sessions that are being held concurrently. With this synthesis session, this is where we try to bring together all the information that has been transmitted, as well as to put together a whole picture, particularly in this year's theme, towards accelerating towards universal health coverage. It is my pleasure to, to introduce the, the lead repertoires for today that will be responsible for synthesizing the whole session. My name is YY Teo. I'm the Dean for the Sorcery Hawk School of Public Health at the National University of Singapore. And with me on the stage are my fellow lead repertoires, Professor Anne Mills, who is the Vice Director for the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine in the UK, Dr. Aquina Tulare, who is from the Department of Health in South Africa, Dr. Walapon, the director for, the, uh, for IHPP, and Dr. Virat, the general secretary for IHPP in Thailand. So without further ado, I would like to invite Professor Anne Mills to give a synthesis of the whole conference. Professor Anne Mills, please. Thank you very much, YY. And the first thing I'd like to say is that what I'm about to present represents the work of a very large number of very skilled rapporteurs. Right down in the first step, the rapporteurs who sum summarized the content of each session, and then the people who worked from yesterday evening through the night, such that by the time the likes of us came along at six in the morning, there was already a well-developed synthesis, which we've then worked on for the last few hours. So many thanks to everyone who's made uh, our work easier and which has provided the basis for this presentation and that I'm now presenting. So just a few preambles before I get into the substance of the report. Um, this was intended to be a healthy meeting um, it continued last year's initiative in trying to encourage healthy eating and exercise through the meeting. Um, I hope that everyone took advantage of the opportunities for the various activities shown here. I'm very sorry, I'm afraid I didn't. There was interest, but not enough will or time. But, but I do hope some of you uh, uh, did your exercise in these areas. Uh, as usual, we had the conference program structure with the pre-conference of 55 side meetings, a huge number of side meetings and excellent attendance that I could see. The field trips, the main conference um, with the addresses, the plenaries, parallel sessions, nearly 700 submissions of world art, excellent. And then total registered participants, over a thousand. And we're getting towards an even balance of men and women. Still a little bit to go. Um, 120 moderators, speakers, and panelists. Uh, again, getting close to an equal balance of men and women. Excellent rep uh, representation across the WHO regions. And in terms of where people come from, I think what we see is one of the strengths of PMAC. Uh, the initial bar, the 23%, is the academic and research communities. But all the other bars represent those involved in policy, decision making, um, the various stakeholders associated with the health system. So an extremely strong uh, representation of those engaged in policy and decision making within the health and broader social and economic systems. So summary and synthesis. To focus on accelerating progress towards UHC. But this uh, photo is intended to really bring home the fact that it's a long road. It's rough, it's winding, it's hard, it's uphill. And some of the uh, figures I'm going to present in this presentation will illustrate both that progress has been made, but still that it's going to be very challenging to make the degree of progress 
that needs to happen. So we should note some UHC achievements, but also some good and bad news. The 2019 Global Monitoring Reports show, for example, that the index of UHC service coverage has improved from 45 out of 100 in 2000 to 66 in 2017. So an average annual 2.3% increase. So an excellent story. But at the same time, the incidence of catastrophic health spending, i.e. out-of-pocket payment which exceeds 10% of the household budget, actually increased from 9.4% to 12.7%. And of course, there are large regional and country variations. And from the Global Monitoring Report in 2019, we've taken this figure, classifying countries by four different categories. In quadrant one, at the top left, there are those which have quite high coverage and pretty low catastrophic expense health spending. On the right-hand quadrant, quadrant two, these countries have high coverage, but also quite high catastrophic expenditure. Below that, quadrant three, countries which have relatively low coverage and high catastrophic expenditure, in a sense, the worst quadrant, people not having access, but spending large amounts of household resources. And then the fourth quadrant, the bottom left, countries which have low coverage, but also have low catastrophic spending, perhaps equally bad as the right-hand quadrant because they're spending, they're spending little, but probably because they don't have access, they may not have financial access, they may have poor geographic access. I'll return to this diagram at the end. But I think this, this way of presenting, of categorizing countries, helps to begin to think of what the policy remedies are in different sorts of country. So con to continue on, on the mixed progress, it's clear and it's been presented at this conference that low and middle income countries do have a variety of financial risk protection systems but these are often fragmented with some schemes and other many people not part of schemes. So there are multiple schemes but with different benefit packages, provider payment methods, expenditure and performance, leading to significant inequality within countries. And also many health systems are fragmented in part because of the financial risk protection systems. And the tendency is for there's low service coverage for the uninsured and associated high out-of-pocket payment. So in this conference, the key areas that are being addressed and that have been addressed and the ones that I want to focus on in these uh, comments is making quality services available and accessible, extending financial risk protection and reducing unmet need, improving governance and accountability and enhancing capacity to monitor and evaluate. So first of all, making quality services available and accessible. The first point we want to emphasize is that there are problems of both access and quality of the existing access. So that this figure is taken from the Health Systems Commission Quality of Health Systems paper in, in the Lancet Global Health data from 137 low and middle income countries, it shows for these variety of conditions that, that in terms of deaths sensitive to healthcare quality, it shows the proportion of the deaths that is, can be attributed to poor quality health services and the proportion attributed to lack of utilization. So for these different conditions, a mix of different problems, but in all cases, problems not only of lack of access, but also of the quality of services that people have access to. So it's important to recognize that translating the Astana aspirations into reality requires significant transformation in health systems. A key point is bringing primary care closer to people, which will make a critical contribution to equity and access. So extending geographical coverage, we know that the health worker density is much below the desired benchmark in the SDGs. And of course, there's a double challenge for the health workforce. 
There's been increased international migration and also domestic migration from public to private and rural to urban. And there's a need to increase training, deployment and retention in rural and hard to reach areas. But it's not just a matter of numbers. It's also critical to improve clinical, public health, cultural and communication competencies of the frontline health workforce. That's a comment on human resources for health. There are other elements that are critical to effective primary health care. The next is to ensure the availability and affordability of essential medicines and vaccines. This requires effective mechanisms that have been well addressed and discussed in this conference. For example, monopsonistic purchasing power, enhancing the monopsonistic purchasing power of public procurers, uh, enforcing price control policies. And we were given the example of Ukraine, where international procurement has resulted in substantial price reduction and more patients accessing treatment. It's important to use the TRIPS flexibility provisions promoting the use of generic medicines. And then a comment on the opportunities created by biosimilars, which make it possible to improve access to certain medicines. And of course, the importance of an effective supply chain, which we have said for so long, I, sometimes I think I've been around the global health space for too many decades. I think each of my decades, I've seen the call for effective supply chains, which needs really addressing the fundamental causes of the problems we see at the moment. Other actions that are necessary, empower individuals and communities to demand better access to health services and to um, influence their own health. To align multi-sectoral actions for health, particularly to address the non-communicable disease epidemic and rapidly aging populations. There's been discussion of the possibilities of public-private partnerships to improve access, but agreement that it requires strong government regulatory capacity, clear contractual agreements, the correct incentives, and good governance. So public-private partnerships are not a solution for weak government capacity. You need government capacity to manage those partnerships. And also investing in health promotion and disease prevention through the life course approach is essential to sustain UHC, to keep people healthy in order to ensure that not too many people fall back on the need for health care and particularly hospital care. So the second main topic we addressed in the conference was extending financial protection and reducing unmet need. There's clearly both inadequate and inefficient spending on health in general, but the extent to which it's inadequate or the extent to which inefficient clearly varies a lot from country to country. There's been specific discussion on the challenges facing countries transitioning from donor support, moving from lower middle income to upper middle income, emphasizing the need to increase domestic financing in order to ensure financial sustainability of their health system and accelerate progress. There's been emphasis on the need to expand po population coverage and financial protection through a rights-based approach and emphasizing social solidarity. Social solidarity is absolutely fundamental to the principles of universal health coverage. And a need, above all, to increase public health spending. So this uh, figure is taken from um, a presentation um, and uh, a report in 2019. It shows the, the problems that have to be tackled in countries which have a very high uh, extent of out-of-pocket spending. So this shows that countries with a high share of out-of-pocket payments in health expenditure have a low share of public spending as a percent of GDP. And that one critical action is to transform that out-of-pocket spending into more organized ways of, of spending on healthcare. So critical then to, to mobilize domestic finance for UHC as the most progressive and sustainable source. And a quote from Gro Harlem Brundtland, I'm thrilled that after decades of often bitter debate, the global health community has come together to champion UHC 
and we've agreed on how to achieve it through publicly financed primary healthcare-led reforms that ensure nobody is left behind. Sessions at the conference agreed on the importance of increasing fiscal space, defined as tax and revenue as a proportion of GDP, through tax reform, improved tax collection efficiency, expanding the tax base, and stimulating economic growth. But for our purposes, uh, with a focus on health, it's also critical that within that fiscal space, health should be prioritized through political commitment to accelerate the growth of general government health expenditure to reach 5% of GDP and 1% of GDP for primary health care. I referred earlier to the journey being long and difficult, and I think that this figure demonstrates that very clearly. It shows current domestic general government health expenditure um, currently in green, in yellow or orange, whatever you see, uh, if 5% of GDP were to be allocated to health. And then it shows that against $112 per capita benchmark. And that benchmark is derived from the 2009 uh, High Level Task Force on Innovative International Financing for Healthcare, which has been updated to 2017 prices. So that, this, this diagram is interesting because it shows two things. One is that there's still a long way to go in countries to meet the 5% of GDP target. But for most of the countries represented here, even meeting that 5% target is not going to bring them close, is, is, not, is not going to bring them to the $112 international benchmark. So a few, they would be well over it. And I think that represents the challenge of universal health coverage, but also the importance of recognizing that it is a journey, that it is a process, that countries are not going to achieve the ultimate goal immediately. The importance is that there's gradual realization of their aspirations. So other ways of extending financial protection uh, we discussed imitative financing for health, for example, the syntax, which Her Royal Highness Princess Dina referred to as a triple win. It prevents NCDs, it saves future NCD treatment costs, and decreases revenue for health. It's important to have a comprehensive benefit package to minimize out-of-pocket payments for non-covered services. There needs to be appropriate co-payment policy, for example, a fixed rate with exemptions for the poor, or an annual cap, not a percentage of bills. There needs to be reform of public financial management to facilitate effective budget execution. Many countries uh, even may fail to spend the budget that is allocated each year. And for countries which have the burden of debt servicing, it's important to seek to maximize the discretionary portion of the budget and recognize the burden they face due to debt servicing. So the next topic the conference discussed was improving governance accountability. A range of extremely important topics. For example, the political economy of UHC reform. And some recommendations that came out of that, some points that came out of that discussion. The need to rebalance power between governments and donors and ensure the alignment of goals. The need for trust-based multi-stakeholder governance to enhance mutual accountability. And the importance of holding donors as well as countries accountable for their action. A somewhat over-emphasis to date on country accountability, there needs to be donor accountability as well. The message that UHC has to be country-driven, and it has to be the country that sets strategic direction, ensures accountability for use of public resources, and ensures good performance at all levels. And there was agreement that legislation has a value in enhancing good governance, can support the process of improving governance. And then it's critical not just to have legislation, but to be able to actually implement it. And that's where it's really critical to strengthen implementation capacities in order to translate legislative provision into action. Rifa Katun has written, 
about the lack of capacity at the leadership level to look at issues from a systems perspective. The health system is complex, requiring actions on a number of fronts that all interrelate with each other. It's critical to embed citizen participation, engagement and empowerment in the UHC governance structure. For example, ensure seats for citizens on the governing body, consult them in the design of the benefit package, have feedback channels, annual public hearings, mandatory consultation processes, and so on. There need to be mechanisms to counter corruption, prevent fraud, and regulatory capture, and enhance transparency. And citizen involvement is one of the key processes for helping with that. And in general, transparency is essential in good governance, and information sharing and effective communication across partners can create trust. And this demonstrates some of the challenges of trust and confidence. This shows the, the proportion of respondents who respond to these questions at the bottom, the proportion who believe that the system works pretty well and only minor changes are needed, who think government handles improving base health service, basic health services well, in terms of confidence, whether they're confident that the sick will receive the most effective treatment, or confident that if they were sick tomorrow, they could get the care she or he need. And you can see that the, there's significant issues across countries at different levels in the degree of trust and confidence that citizens have in their health systems. And this needs addressing. And then the example of Thailand, which has given us this grasp uh, diagram. So demonstrating or arguing that in Thailand, some of the key important factors to do with their success are to do with good government, the health system research and regulatory capacity, the brain, um, inadequate and equitable health systems, the body, uh, financing, which provides the energy, and then political social commitment and ownership, which is the soul or the spirit, a really nice way of, of, of portraying in a different way the different elements that are needed to make success of universal health coverage. And then the need to enhance capacity to monitor and evaluate. So it's important to focus not just on the level, but also distribution as a key priority is to close the gaps between economic groups and across subnational levels. Countries need geospatial information to facilitate health infrastructure investment and disease surveillance to work out where best to invest, which are the most underserved areas. Effective coverage has to be monitored, not just coverage, but effective courage, coverage to enhance health gain. But some key challenges in this area of monitoring and evaluation which need to be addressed. Current difficulties of estimating primary health care and total pharmaceutical expenditure. Lack of information on what is actually being spent, which makes it difficult to decide how much more to spend and to monitor progress. The challenges of knowing unmet health care needs, that health surveys aren't good at doing that. And the need to obtain both epidemiological and clinical data in order to produce this indicator of effective coverage. And then finally, this conference has sought to discuss not just UHC, the problems, current problems, what needs to be done within the health system, but it also wanted to acknowledge, address, and discuss some global megatrends and to lead up to next year's conference where they will be addressed in more detail. So climate change threatens humanity and hampers achievement of the SDGs. And it requires health systems to adapt and mitigate impacts. And health systems themselves must be part of the, some of the actors um, mitigating the impact of climate change. And to note that climate change will have massive effects on population habitats and survival. And then another challenge is geopolitics and political conflicts. They are already resulting in massive migration of refugees and displaced populations, which climate change will aggravate. Also, the shift from multilateralism towards bilateral agreement 
is hampering international collective efforts to protect health. And then the huge challenge of changing population demography. An aging society poses a double threat to health systems, creates higher healthcare demands at the same time as a shrinking labor force. And to note that rapid urbanization that's been happening is not accompanied by significant, sufficient investment in health infrastructure, especially for the urban poor. And then finally, digital and artificial intelligence creates both opportunities and risks. It may help to replace low quality healthcare mainly used by the poor, improve quality of the service they can access and therefore reduce inequality. It may even outperform the human capacity for visual identification, for example, reading x-rays in five to 10 years. It should reduce the cost and time burden of personnel and increase productivity. But there are a number of associated problems of which only a couple are mentioned here. One is the problem of biases in the data it uses, producing a risk of increased inequality because of those biases. And the classic phrase when computers first became to be used of garbage in means garbage out. And then very important discussions at the conference on governance of digital and artificial intelligence and recognition that the capacity to regulate is limited and that there are huge problems of privacy and regulation and use of data and so on. So, a very few uh, brief points in conclusion. Uh, to note again from Her Royal Highness the Princess Dina that UHC is a right, it is not a gift. It's about informed political choice, not just political choice, but informed political choice and needs to be informed by evidence. And then the importance of mobilizing science for humanity that we heard from the two uh, Prince Mahed and Award laureates at the opening of the conference. So for example, for Professor Bartenschlager, he commented that there was a scientific breakthrough, initially very expensive, but the cost of direct acting antiviral agents for hep C has been reduced from 30,000 euro to 25 to $80 for the generic medicines per treatment course. And that he expects much further progress to be made in reducing the cost. So a few uh, summary recommendations to differentiate country actions by the four quadrants of UHC coverage index and incidence of catastrophic spending. That's the quadrant in the, in the top right-hand corner. I'm not going to go in the details. They were covered in the editorial of the WHO bulletin that uh, accompanies this conference. To prioritize general tax funding as the most progressive and sustainable source of financing healthcare. Again, Grohal and Brundtland, if there's one lesson the world has learned, is that you can only reach UHG through public financing. You cannot reach it through private voluntary insurance, which is inefficient and inequitable. Thirdly, to spend more through enhancing fiscal space for health and spending wisely. And finally, to enhance regulatory capacities for managing public-private partnerships. And to note from Nelson Mandela, Health cannot be a question of income, it is a fundamental human right. So just in summary, to thank all of the uh, lead rapporteurs and the rapporteur coordin coordinators, um, and uh, to note that behind us, we only just put the little bit of polish on the final work, we have all of these behind us who were the session rapporteurs, and to thank them for all of their hard work. And finally, to note uh, from uh, Prince Mahidon that true success is not in the learning, but it in its application for the benefit of mankind, what we would now say as humankind. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Ann Mills. And before we go to the question and answer question stage, I would like to invite all the rapporteurs who have contributed to this to please stand up and for the audience to give them a round of applause because they have been working very hard to put together this synthesis. 
And this will be the, the gentlemen and ladies that are wearing the, the Repertoire T-shirt that all of us are in, in blue. So thank you again very much. So I think another point that we have to re remember is that in the United Nations General Assembly just held last September, there was a political declaration specifically around universal health coverage, which countries did sign up to, with a very clear emphasis on expanding the fiscal space for primary health care. But I think from what we have seen in the report, it is not just about sufficiency for many of the low- and middle-income countries, expanding the 1% additional GDP is not sufficient. But even for the upper- and middle-income countries, it is not only about expanding the fiscal space, but equally about making sure that it is spent wisely and efficiently. Now, at this point, I would like to invite the audience to approach the microphones at various sides of the hall to invite for your interventions and your comments. We don't have a lot of time. We have only about 20 minutes left, and I would like to have as many people as possible, preferably also from the young people in the audience. Please, when you approach the mic, give, uh, uh, say your name and re the organization you represent. And I would like to take a few questions before I let our lead repertoire team respond to that. Ma'am, please. Uh, good morning. Uh, I'm Sulakshna from the People's Health Movement. Um, I think one thing that um, uh, we've discussed um, and, and, uh, and, and that is, I think, missing in the recommendations, and I would really urge the plenary uh, to add that, is uh, our commitment to strengthening and developing uh, the government uh, health service delivery. Uh, I know for the, I mean, I'm, I, I know that for the panelists um, in front of me, uh, this is something which is um, something they have very, a lot of confidence in. And they, you know, and, and sometimes we think that it is implicit in what we are saying. But the problem is that unless we are very explicit about it, the way it gets, um, uh, you know, implemented or transferred to countries, it is then, you know, it just takes a very different um, uh, sort of a design, and I mean, we're seeing this in India, you know, where, I mean, yesterday we had our health budget, our budget come in, and, and there's been huge decrease in the health budget, and, 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 and a complete emphasis on privatization and building private hospitals with public funds and privatizing the district hospitals, which are going to have huge consequences because the implicate, I mean, I mean, the experience has shown that in India, the, you know, the out-of-pocket expenditure is increasing, despite everything that is happening, and also the immense inequity in access of health services. That's also being exacerbated. So I would really urge the panelists to make it very, and, and the group, to make it very explicit that you know we really need to start from strengthening and developing the government uh, health systems for delivery of services. Thank you. Thank you very much, ma'am. Just to and I'm very pleased that you approached the mic from People's Health Movement, and this is where I would like to remind the audience in the we have lost a strong advocate from the People's Health Movement who would always approach the mic, Dr. David Sanders. And <laughs> Thank you. And on this point, on the commitment to strengthen government service delivery, perhaps Dr. Virat, I would direct this question to you to respond in a bit. But I will, we will take the second question from this gentleman before we move on to the lady on the deck. We will take three questions before we respond. Sir, please. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I'm Hannes Rock from University of Texas Medical Branch and also with uh, People's Health Movement. Um, thank you very much for the excellent uh, uh, summary and uh, thank you for the emphasis that we uh, equally need to reduce spending, not only to uh, increase the revenues. And I think during the, the conference, there were many suggestions on how we can use the available budgets wisely and efficiently. And I hope that the uh, synthesis includes certain examples of, 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 of these, not just uh, a general statement. Uh, some of the suggestions made during uh, uh, the conference that big portion of spending goes to pharmaceutical products. So the encouragement and uh, uh, support of production of generic medicine at country level is imperative uh, for that. Number two, the use of flexibilities of TRIPS agreement, including compulsory license, is one of the important ways to reduce uh, uh, the expenditure. 
and also to increase the uh, spending on preventive measures which will eventually reduce the burden of disease on secondary and tertiary uh, care, which is very uh, costly. And this reminds us that we need to continue refer to al Mata declaration in the synthesis of the PMAC. So we need to focus on the comprehensive framework of al Mata and focus on the prevention to reduce the costs as well. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for your comments, sir. Thank you. To the lady on the left, please. Uh, Amina from the Singh Health Duke and US Global Health Institute. I wanted to just um, re-emphasize a theme that has kind of come up not only in this conference but over time as, as some other themes, and that the word from, uh, that kind of really sticks in my mind is alignment. So it's alignment of you know, vertical and horizontal programs, alignment of donors and government spending, alignment of um, world trade policies versus health policies. So really I wanted to kind of get a feedback of maybe we can emphasize that Let's stop talking about it and let's really start doing something about this because it seems there's often a mismatch and we have good intentions, but are we all aligned in the right way? Thank you, Amina. So we have three questions. Uh, if I could direct the second question to Dr. Wallapon to talk a little bit about the, re the recommendations, that specific recommendations that we can make on how to make use of available budgets wisely and efficiently. I think collectively we agree that this has to be the case. And Dr. Walaipon, I know that the, the International Health Policy Program that you lead is very much responsible for putting together a synthesis as well as a, a report of PMAC. And this perhaps will be very much in your court. And the third question on alignment of vertical and horizontal program. Aquina, perhaps you can give a little bit of the, the country experience in South Africa. So. We, We'll hold the questions. Uh, Dr. Virat, on the first part about really, it is not just about the policy, but equally important on the implementation. How is the health services delivery implemented on the ground in an efficient and sustainable way? Dr. Virat, please. Um, can the secretary post on the screen slide number nine? Uh, as Professor Ann Mill has um, introduced to you, It is harmful. Slice number nine, please. It is harmful to access to poor quality of services. Take, for example, cardiovascular diseases. Worldwide, among 137 low- and middle-income countries, there were 250,000 deaths from cardiovascular diseases from access to poor quality services and less so very minimum from no access to cardiovascular treatments. Therefore, how we ensure that primary health care and hospital care are of high quality and patient safety. So it is the civil society, it is an active citizen who hold government account. It is PHM or United Front of CSO to ensure that in South Asia there is no absenteeism Citizen scorecard is so in, uh, critical to ensure that government are accountable. Therefore, um, primary care uh, level must be of high quality because it's too harmful to access to poor quality services. Thank you, Virat. On the second point, Walapon, could you talk a little bit about the recommendations and how the specific examples on making use of available budget wisely? Thank you, uh, YY. For the uh, concrete example, exactly we will include it. For example, we talked yesterday on the health technology assessment, which is very useful for the upstream policy process of uh, making decision, which intervention will be included in the benefit package. And then not only the cost effectiveness uh, criteria, but we will also look at the other criteria, for example, the budget implication for the country readiness of the uh, supply side. Uh, in addition, not only the uh, curative treatment, yesterday in the session, one session in session number 2.5, they talk more on focusing on the um, effectiveness, cost effectiveness of the uh, prevention and health promotion intervention as well. Someone also uh, mentioned about the nutrition. We should not um, 
focus only the um, using money wisely within the health sector, but need to also promote some other social determinant of health as well. Another example, um, no, not example, but we know that we need to monitor for the downstream implementation as well. Once the benefit package is um, set using the government budget for the implementation, whether it is a real action at the local level, and then we need to monitor in order to ensure that those money translated into the services for the people. Thank you. Thank you, Walapon. So very clear recommendations will be included in the report, but our, our speaker actually gave three specific examples, very better and wise use of technology, a very good use of trade flexibility provision, and also clearly the message on focusing on prevention and promotion services. Now, Aquina, on the question on the alignment of vertical and horizontal program, how, how, what are the actions that we should be doing to emphasize this alignment? Because it's, I think it's long overdue. The, align, the, 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 the notion of alignment in general is very, very important. And I, I want to uh, give uh, an example of how South Africa is dealing with this because previously we were focusing a lot on vertical pro programs such as disease-based programs, HIV and TB, and uh, it tends to leave the more systems issues uh, weak. So we are currently integrating horizontal and vertical programs so that we look at the whole system in general instead of just focusing on one of the areas being vertical programs. Because if you do that, for example, if a program is funded by a donor, when they pull out and you have not addressed your systems issues of creating stronger systems, the system collapses. Also, in terms of uh, alignment of donors, it is very important that donors work with countries. They do not come and uh, impose certain conditions without them sticking to that. I think a good example of this was given when uh, uh, Professor Jesse Bump made a presentation around how donors would commit and say we are going to do X, Y, and Z but they do not follow through. And uh, the expectation is that countries must do what uh, it is being recommended. Countries have to lead the process of universal health coverage. And when donors come in, they must align to national policies so that you know, uh, they strengthen uh, those uh, policies. And that's our approach also. Thank you very much. And I see that we have a few questions I think there was a, a lady over here. Perhaps we'll, we'll give preference to the lady first, and then secondly, followed by the gentleman here. Ma'am, please. Thank you. Very general equality. So uh, my name is So. I'm uh, coming from Myanmar. Uh, I'm working as a UN, uh, in UNOPS, managing fund called Access to Health Fund, supported by four donors, US, UK, and Switzerland, and Sweden. Uh, my, uh, this is my first time attending BMAC, and then the, I learned a lot, and then also very good experience, learning experience for the new uh, 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 people like me, because previously I'm only engaged in the international conference for the infectious diseases as well. And then the, in the, uh, the synthesis section, I learned that uh, the invitations and also participation from the private sector is still limited, only 5% of the attendance. So maybe, maybe it is due to the not uh, going out the wider in, in, uh, invitation or I didn't see the, uh, the specific section uh, on the, the engagement with the private sector, even though we are promoting a lot for the, the PPP. So this is one thing. And also, there the, also uh, I noticed the invitation going out to the youth, but uh, there is no specific section related to their youth participation in the UAC, even though some youth leaders already expressed uh, their willingness to take part in, and also without the support of the uh, leaders like this, uh, the UAC leaders, uh, they, they cannot be uh, uh, they are engaged fully in the forum. So this is the one su the suggestion from me. 
Then the, the specific question for the Myanmar, like the, we are uh, uh, supporting a lot on the system strengthening, but right now, there, I think uh, our journey to the UAC is still a uh, long way to go that we have to admit. And then also we are promoting a lot on the provision of the integration service, integrated service package, uh, 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 then learning from the other country experience. So, but uh, from this uh, conference, especially for the this year forum is our UAC forum, we expected the PMEC, you know, like a, a kind of advocacy on the uh, leadership, you know, the uh, action plan for the country specific context and then also are uh, pushing into the uh, bringing the attention and also the commitment from the leadership level for example like the ministry and then the minister and also the government so then you know the the key stakeholders in the country has a very clear uh, action plan then you know and then get a support from the wider international community and the, which is the uh, more uh, appropriate way uh, to get the more commitment from the leaders. So that's the, my special request to the um, organizers as well. Thank you. Thank you very much, ma'am. Uh, specific comment from you was around the PMAC and engagement with the private sector and participation of the youth leaders. And you, you have a specific a second comment really around stakeholder engagement, uh, particularly around leaders of multiple sectors. And for this question, perhaps, I could invite Dr. Virat later on to, uh, to talk a little bit about the National Health Assembly and how that involves multi-sectoral uh, participation. And I think uh, Wale Pond was also indicating that she would like to speak, but just hold your horses a bit. We'll take the second question, very quick points because we're running out of point time, and I, but I really want to get as many uh, good comments and questions as possible. Sir, please. Thank you. I'm uh, Dr. Pante from uh, NSSO Thailand. I have the question, uh, it's, uh, in the Thailand uh, now, have uh, the draft of the uh, le uh, health security reform from the Senate of uh, Thai Parliament. Uh, the draft is will uh, public hearing, it's uh, next Tuesday, it's, uh, it's uh, for, uh, setting the goal for the uh, health expenditure from the GDP, it said only uh, 3.5 percent of GDP and not more than uh, 4.5 percent GDP. So that is not uh, aligned with the recommend uh, from the synthesis. Uh, it's recommend uh, 5 percent of GDP and uh, at least 1 percent for family health care uh, GDP for the uh, health uh, expenditure in this country. So. Uh, in my question is how to uh, uh, communication the recommendation to our uh, key stakeholder in each country, such as uh, is the Thailand from the uh, Parliament, uh, Senate, uh, Senate Parliament, uh, and the government, and something like that. So uh, it's a uh, uh, my question again is. Uh, how to uh, prepare the recommend of the PMAC, this PMAC, to uh, each key stakeholder and for the social movement, for the appropriate way. Thank you very much. So perhaps I'll expand this, I'll take it beyond the context of Thailand and really direct the question to Professor Ann Mills, really around the, the, the question of how do we unlock budget to reach the aspirational targets that we have set of around at least 5% of the GDP for health. Um, and last question for, for this, if I could direct it. Dr. Wiwat, would you be agreeable if we give the opportunity to our friend here to ask the question? Thank you very much, Dr. Wiwat. Sir, please. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, facilitator. The friend's name is Matota Sambata from South Africa. Thank you. On the basis of... Uh, the quotation from one of the elders on financing being uh, predominantly the responsibility of the public sector. And then yesterday's argument on finance ministers from Mars, health ministers from uh, Venice. 
and also on the basis of reality that across the world there's always a direct contradiction on approaches, especially for financing, between finance ministers and uh, health ministers. Would it not be possible that the conference, because finance ministers like hiding behind World Bank theories and WTO theories when refusing funding, would it not be possible that conference at least work up a very proper recommendation on the recommendations on strengthening collaboration, cooperation, and common approach in the two ministries as a basis to realize universal health coverage without being instructional to finance ministers, at least a very mild a sense of collaboration and cooperation. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, sir. And I, I think this, this third question, I would like to combine it with the first question, which is really around how do we raise the health agenda when there are multiple stakeholders in the problem that is not just addressed by a single Ministry of Health or Public Health, but really involves national development, transportation, more importantly, trade as well as finance. Uh, Dr. Virat, followed by Dr. Walapon. Virat, please. Um, on Dr. Ponte's question, can I? It's a specific question that um, there's a proposal in the House uh, Health Committee of floor and ceiling of, um, I don't know whether it's a, a current total, current health expenditure, three and a half to four and a half percent GDP? Or is it a GGHE as 3.5% GDP or 4.5% of GDP, floor and ceiling? The recommendation of 5% GDP in the PowerPoint slide is GGHE, government spending on health 5%, which is quite unrealistically high. It is a technical recommendation it is not in the UN General Assembly resolution at all. Only 1% additional percent of GDP will, should be contributed to PSC, which is embedded in one article of the UNJ uh, Declaration, High Level Declaration on USC in 2019. Therefore, I think uh, next Thursday, they trigger a public hearing process. Uh, I think the scientific evidence should be made clear and put everyone on the same page, that this floor and ceiling is adequate or not. Bear in mind that uh, we have quite efficient uh, financing mechanism through strategic purchasing, um, um, brand model of capitation, DRG, under global budget. Although we have free for service, uh, absurdly high among civil servant medical benefit scheme. That is one of the black spots that require attention for reform further. I think um, I will ask back to NHSO and partner civil society in Thailand to further uh, uh, consult uh, among yourself and consult with NHSO and partners how the floor and ceiling should be quite uh, legit and whether it's a CHE as percent of GDP or it is a GGHE, General Government Health Expenditure as percent GDP. So it's, it's still unclear. Now, our colleague from Africa, I think um, it is a multi-sectoral action. Um, in May this year, there will be uh, in Seoul a consultation convened by ADB and Western Pacific Legion Office and Southeast Asia Legion Office of two ministry, finance, and Health Ministry on to drive USC agenda. So uh, it's true that um, we need a more uh, dialogue and MOF um, understand and not uh, advocate private financing, uh, private voluntary insurance as a main driver of USC, which is uh, very harmful and not, not uh, useful uh, recommendations. Thank you, Virat. While I hold your horses, I'll let you round up. Uh, but a quick comment from Anne, really around how do we unlock budget 
to raise healthcare expenditure budgets, please? Very brief, because I think in some ways that was answered by the last question, which is that it's, it's a question of dialogue. Um, I, I think it is important to recognize that, particularly in countries which are low public spenders on health, it is a huge challenge to get that percentage to increase and that there has to be a dialogue between the ministry and the Minister of Health and their counterparts in finance. And I think that part of that is that the convincing case needs to be put forward uh, of the importance of increasing public financing. And there is a very clear pattern with only one or two outliers that as countries grow richer, it is both efficient and equitable to channel a high proportion of money for health or to, to finance a high proportion of health spending from public sources. Um, and that that leads to a more efficient outcome. So I think it's making that case, but also having the dialogue and also having the social action that makes it clear that that is what people want to argue for and that they can trust the health system to deliver if it has that money. Thank you. Thank you, Anne. And last comment from Wallapon around how do you encourage and strengthen co cooperations and collaborations between health, finance, and perhaps even trade, even national development, really bringing the necessary stakeholders, not just from the government, but equally from the private sector, from the civil societies as well. Wallapon, please. Um, I borrowed the um, sentence of uh, Kenji Shibuya yesterday. He said, normally we talk about public health, but he changed a little bit health of the public, but I would say it's health of the society. If everyone agree on health of the society, and then health is not just only for the health sector to do alone, but need the multi-sectoral action to do it for the health of the society, and then it will be an investment on health of the society. That is the key. Thank you. And I with that, I would like to take this opportunity to thank all the repertoires who have been working very hard to put together this synthesis and my fellow lead repertoires on the stage. Thank you again for, for the opportunity. Thank you. Thank you.